Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or you have been here and haven't done so just yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm. And prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro an ad will play, I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Oh, and before I forget, if you have a marked birthday, kindly go over to the community tab on the main page and find the birthday listings to make sure that you get your shout out at the end of the March 1st video. Now, on with the vocal melatonin, shall we? It's been quite a few years since this happened, so my memory's a little fuzzy, but I figured I would try to piece some stuff together. This was around summertime of 2018 or so, so I must have been freshly 14. My grandma had given me a couple quarters and told me to go to the community laundry room to get a Dr. Pepper from the vending machine. She offered enough for me to get one as well. And it was still light enough that I could walk down the sidewalk and get back before the sunset, if I was quick enough. Getting into the laundry room and getting the soda was easy enough, but as soon as I exited the building, a car idling in the middle of the street caught my eye. It hadn't been there when I had gone in. I was already put off by this, as I had stranger danger drilled into my head for as long as I could remember. The car had its windows rolled down, and the driver was a young woman with two older, I want to say maybe mid-thirties, men in the back seat. They were looking straight at me and beckoning me closer. I immediately thought, oh, fuck no, to myself, and quickly broke eye contact and made my way quickly back down the street. As if the car knew the complex, they drove alongside me and pulled into the parking spot next to my grandmother's car. They started laughing with each other, still looking at me and whispering about something. At this point, I was terrified out of my little 14-year-old mind. I walked quickly inside my grandmother's apartment, locked and bolted that door, and couldn't sleep for the rest of my visit. Nothing came of it, but I thank my lucky stars every day that I avoided anything more than an unsettling encounter. So, weirdos from my grandmother's old apartment complex, let's not ever meet again. This story happened to me and my girlfriend, who is now my fiance. To give you some context, she and I met online in 2015 and fell in love. We communicated via Skype for three years because we lived in separate countries until I came to live with her in February 2018. So a few weeks or so before I flew in to meet her, she had made friends with a group of guys in her hometown and I got to meet them shortly after living with her. They ranged in age from 16 to 18 years and they would come over to visit us very often because we lived close to the high school they attended. At first, I found it a bit weird that they would always come over and take up so much of our time, but they turned out to be really good friends over time. One of them even agreed to be one of my groomsmen recently. But back then, there was one particular that always bugged me. Dan. As I mentioned earlier, the guys would come and visit and hang out with us a lot, but Dan was the one that would always take up most of our time. I say this in the sense that he would message us early, almost every day, asking if we were home and if he could come over. 
and would proceed to spend almost the entire day from morning to night, or early afternoon to night, depending on his work schedule, at our place. He would also go out of his way to meet us and bump into us wherever we went, whether it was the store, a coffee shop, or any other place you could think of. While I found this annoying, there wasn't anything particularly creepy or weird going on as of yet. Mind you, we live in a small town where it's almost impossible to not run into someone you know, especially on the way to buy groceries or something like that. Plus, I had only known him for about as long as my fiancé had known him, which wasn't a very long time, so I thought I was maybe judging him too harshly. Also, he was in a long-distance relationship with a girl from another country whom he was hoping to meet in real life, just like me, so I could at least relate to him in that aspect. I decided to let it slide, but made a note to keep an eye out for any suspicious behavior. The problem seemed to start once he also started to try to incorporate himself into other aspects of our life. He would make friends with anyone we'd been friends with for a long time, tag along with us whenever we were going to meet up with said friends, even though he hadn't been invited, hang out with them without us knowing, etc. My favorite instance, and the one that made me become more suspicious with him was one time when we were going to hang out with some longtime friends of my fiance. As the friend had finished her shift and we were getting ready to get into the car to drive over to her place, Dan suddenly shows up and joins us to their place, uninvited, mind you. It was just so off-putting that he would just invite himself over without our friends or even our permission. Then, when we were done there and walking home, the three of us passed his house. We lived far away at the time and assumed he'd go home. But, nope. He kept tagging along with us with the excuse that he needed to buy something at the store, which was bullshit since all stores had been closed for over an hour, and he knew that. So he kept walking with us until at one point, when we were almost home, we put our foot down and told him that we were tired and just wanted to go to sleep as soon as we got home, and also told him to go home. It took us about 10 minutes to convince him, during which he would react to our requests with awkward and creepy silences until he finally just headed home, annoyed. My fiancé, concerned that she may have offended him, asked if he wanted to hang out with us later in the week. What followed was various weeks of him coming over to our place staying until late at night and him slowly leaving more and more of his stuff at our place so he'd have an excuse to come over. I shit you not, he once brought over his PS3 with a bag of 30 or so games which stayed there for three months. It got to the point where people thought he was moving in with us. He also seemed to have problems with all of our friends. Among other things, he would get into arguments with our friends and told one friend who was goofing off around at our place once that he'd kill him if he didn't shut up. He lied to us and made us believe that two good friends of ours wanted to report us to the police for drugging our friends. I mentioned earlier that some of them were 16 at the time. He allegedly hit one of our friend's girlfriend once. This was never confirmed but I have no reason to believe it's a lie, etc. It was like he wanted us all to himself and to isolate us from our friends. The last thing he did, which ended up being the key to us getting rid of him forever, was that he started dating my fiance's cousin, MJ. He broke up with his long distance girlfriend under suspicious circumstances and started dating her. As a result, whenever MJ came to visit, Dan would come along as well. My fiancé wanted to hang out with MJ. There was Dan. Even when he was dating someone else, his obsession with us never ended. One day, when we were in town, we met another friend of ours, and Dan insisted that we'd hang out with that guy all day when we'd already agreed to do something else. 
When he refused, he and MJ ditched us to be with him. And that was when we had had enough. We got into a huge fight later that day in a park with some of our friends as witnesses and told him off, telling him we wanted nothing to do with him anymore and to pack up his shit and never show his face at our place again. This unfortunately resulted in my fiancé and MJ not talking to each other for a long time. We had to move a few times since then, the most recent being February of last year. And we never saw him and blocked him on all of our social media and blocked him out of our lives. We know from friends that he tried a few times to ask around where we live, but our friends always had our backs and didn't tell him. MJ and my fiancé recently made up after she dumped him. And now that the sour taste he left behind is for the most part gone, it goes without saying that we never wanted to see him again. Before the story, please forgive me if I do any English mistakes. I'm French and English is not my first language. When I was in high school, I was like 16 then, I had a friend, Lisa, and a second friend, Zoe. Lisa had like a lot of money and her huge house was located right next door to our high school. So every time we had a break or anything, the three of us would go there and we also would have a lot of sleepovers at our house. It was this huge, rich people's house, so it was awesome to stay there. So one day, we decided to stay the night there. The three of us, plus Lisa's little sister, Anna, their mother was gone for the night. We decided to put on some PJs and watch scary movies for hours. Anna went to bed before us three, and we stayed in the living room watching TV. At one point, the alarm goes on. It happens sometimes. So Lisa just goes and turns it off, and that was that. But then, like 10 minutes later, the alarm goes off again, and it scared the shit out of us, because it's not supposed to. Technically, the alarm was made to ring only when humans come by, because the house was located in the middle of the forest, so we all knew that sometimes animals would come by the house. It's happened before. So when the alarm was installed, it was calibrated for humans only. And it was the second time it rang. We started to get a little bit scared, so we went upstairs, opened the windows to look at the garden all around the house, and nothing. We even went on the balcony in the middle of the night. Nothing. I was alone on the balcony at some point, and the alarm went off again and the automatic lights around the swimming pool turned on. That meant something was around the pool, and I was just right above it. I got so scared I got on my knees and stayed there until my friend deactivated the alarm and the lights, and I ran inside the house. At this point, we were really, really scared and started thinking about what it could be. If it has to be any human... All our lights were on, so they knew where we were. We turned off all the lights, and all four of us went hiding downstairs in the kitchen without our phones. I don't even know why not even one of us thought about taking a damn phone with us. So we were there, lights off, scared in a huge house with windows everywhere we could look. The alarm went berserk again. Anna screamed. Lisa took her with her, reassuring her while walking to shut the alarm off, like turn it off once and for all. So I was in the kitchen with Zoe only, and we were just looking all around us. The alarm was upstairs, so the two girls were far from us. At some point, we heard footsteps right behind us, like right on the other side of the wall in the garden. It was fast, not scared, just fast, like that person knew where they were going. So we just freezed, waiting in the dark, and jumped when something, well, someone, it was obvious, walked by the door and window right in front of us. He, we think it was a he, 
had a light, but it was another light that allowed us to see his silhouette. So there were at least two running around the house for about at least 20 to 30 minutes. Detail by this door was like I said, a window door, but there was Venetian blinds on it. They were not closed, of course. We were still not moving, and the girls upstairs were so scared that they stayed there. At least that's what they told us they did. Suddenly, one voice, then a second one. I was unable to understand anything, but I heard it, and Zoe and I were blinded by a sudden light right at our faces. We were literally not able to move, scream, talk. Not anything we could have done was passable. We were just frozen in fear. The light stayed there. Someone was seeing us trout the blind. Someone was watching us, being scared, and was just staying there. Suddenly, we heard a hard sound on the front door, which was closed. Zoe didn't move at all, but I don't know what took me. It just woke me up, and I crawled to the door in front of me, which is the back door, by the way. I closed the blinds and just hold the door in place in case the guys on the other side try to force it. Honestly, I'm small and thin. My little brother was useless there, but I did it anyway. The one at the front door was still trying to enter. Zoe still not moving. The two girls upstairs doing I don't know what. And the one just at the glass window away from me started hitting it, trying to force it open. Of course, it was closed, but I just grabbed the handle and hung in there for a while. He was just hitting and trying to open the door. All this lasted hours in my head, but I believe it was only a few seconds. At one point, the hits at the front door stopped. A few seconds later, the other one in front of me stopped as well. Then the lights just moved fast everywhere. The alarm did nothing, so it was disabled as wanted, and there was nothing. Zoe and I just slept in the kitchen, and the two sisters upstairs. Nothing happened at all. It was finally over. The next day, Lisa and Anna's mom came back home. We told her everything. Got a bit yelled at because we didn't call the cops. I took it wrong at the time, but I understand now why she was upset. She called the cops, who went to see the house, and just discovered footsteps all around the house, some muddy footprint and mark on the front door. They said they must have kicked the door, and that was it. They told us it must have been some guys who were just doing some recognition, you know, when they just walk around the houses to see how to rob it. It was common in this area. There was a lot of really big, and beautiful houses filled with expensive things. The only thing I will never be able to explain is why they started being so aggressive. Originally, they were just walking around the house, but I think that if they were trying to see something or just look things up, they would have left when they realized we were inside, or at least left when that guy saw us in the kitchen. Well, they didn't. The moment they saw us in the kitchen, they didn't see the two sisters. They start being aggressive and trying to force the doors to enter the house where we were. I don't know if they really wanted to rob the house. I will never, and honestly, I don't ever want to know. I didn't spend any more nights at that house. I got so scared that they would come back again. I couldn't sleep there. Lisa got a bit mad like she didn't understand. But from what she told Zoe and I, she didn't see them. She just stayed upstairs with her sister. I understand it, but I wasn't able to stand the fact that she couldn't accept how scared I really was. Okay, before I get into the story, here's a few things I need to explain about my country. South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime rate here is hectic. 
It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time, we had six dogs, two Sharpays, two German short-haired pointers, and two dash hounds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in domestic partner, a maid, and gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our DW is Ellie, and our gardener is Vince. So, this happened in 2007, when I was around 9 years old. My older brother, 10 at the time, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprising us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, due to security reasons. But I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in our parents' bedroom setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter, Anne, who's like her older sister to us, 18, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bathtub, I think. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was getting. That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark, but it was usually the dash hounds that yapped when the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes. Then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dog's incessant barking, and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head, and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either, because my brother asked to investigate with him, and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow, when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling, and going nuts at a dark corner behind our, in the ground, swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is, our garden beyond our pool hits like a slight decline, so we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad had noticed how that lamp seemed to be off which confused him because he could have sworn it worked just the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this and because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called after them. They'd usually come running. But tonight, they all seemed to just look at my hem, then turn back around and continue going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch, sort of using it as an excuse for my brother not to come with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dogs seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched toward the steps and as he put two and two together, it was too late. My dad, being an ex-bed and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple, and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four other men in balaclavas, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. Why? My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, He's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. 
They started speaking in an African language called Zulu, assuming my dad couldn't understand. It's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learnt it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said in Zulu, Shit, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this fucker, grab what we can, and go. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge and continued to say how he can't go back to jail again, and they need to get the fuck out before the cops show up, which would be in any minute now. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area. And since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled right before them. The smaller, scared guy started freaking out all of the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd be caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan slowly turning to shit, as a third guy had put it. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the stairs and turn to dart towards the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm mid-run and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quickly as possible, without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything. When my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut, and told us to go upstairs into the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel, not too far behind. We sat there in the darkness, in silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed, saying she didn't have a phone. Neither did my dad. But ha! In my hand was that brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, they asked where we lived. We explained, and they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only shitting ourselves, but we are flabbergasted too. My mom started cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realized, damn, he didn't close the veranda door. What about Ellie and Bent, who were in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us that whatever we hear to not come downstairs, to stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Ellie and Bent before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears as reality hits that there's two people still in danger. And understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dog going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They say to wait and stay hidden until they ring our doorbell at the gate. We will wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. 
After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs, and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was my dad with Ellie and Ben's. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while. No one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked to see if it was the security company, and sure enough, it sure was. He opened up, and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body just endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed right over. We got an electric fence shortly after. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture and sexual assault to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time. I didn't know the horrors of the world and was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me the chills still to this day. The cop said the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicates that these guys possibly had sinister intentions. Thank God nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened that night, had it not been for our incredible doggos. From that day onwards, my dad always gave them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. Rest in peace, Impy, Shutu, Dash, Fudge, Wrinkles, and Pikachu. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved for you angels. I was out partying this Friday night with four of my female friends two of which I have just met that evening. We were having drinks at a club in Central Europe. The night was going great. We were dancing and talking. All of us had fun. At around 2 a.m., the girls grabbed a taxi and went home. I have stayed a bit more in the club to finish my drink. I have danced on the stage for about 20 minutes. Then, I have grabbed a taxi and went home. When I arrived on the street where I live, my drunk ass realized that I have no keys and I couldn't get home as I live alone. So I called another taxi and went back to the club to look for my keys. First, I went to the bar to ask if anyone had brought any lost keys to them that night. Unfortunately, they didn't have my keys. So I started to look for them in the club in every place that I was in that night. I have turned on the flashlight on my phone and have been looking for my keys in a mass of people. About 10 minutes go by, and I haven't found anything apart from broken glass and cigarette butts. I went back to the place where I was initially looking for them. This is the place where we have been having our drinks with the girls. I have started to look for my keys on the sitting benches instead of on the ground. I had my keys in the inside pocket of my jacket, as I always do, and my jacket was placed in the corner of that bench the whole night before I first left. People were sitting on the benches, and they've had their jackets on the benches too. I sat near the corner where I was sitting before, and beside me was a guy with lines of some drugs on his phone, freely giving them to other people. He had put his jacket in the corner of the bench, and I wanted to look at the corner of the bench to see if my keys 
haven't been pushed into the corner or something. So, I grabbed his jacket, and to my surprise, my keys were right under his jacket, in the middle of the bench. I was so happy to find my keys. I was drunk and started pretty much yelling how happy I am to find my house keys, as I was getting fucking desperate at that time. There was a guy on that bench that we have met with the girls before in the club. I will call him L. He was really nice during the whole night, and so I kept talking to L when I found my keys. I've even went to the bar and grabbed another beer just to talk for a bit more with L. I went to the toilet to have a pee, and when I came back, L had found herself an acquaintance to which he was talking. So I just started to finish my beer while I smoked a cigarette and was getting ready to go home. This is when the guy that had lines of some drugs on his phone had started talking to me. I will call him Pedro, as it was definitely a fake name that he gave me. I've been talking with him in English. Pedro was 19 years of age and he was from Colombia. He told me stories about how life is in Colombia and how his family struggles. He told me that his father has died recently, and he is the eldest son, so he is the Slovakia trying to make some money for the family. He even showed me photos of him and his family back in Colombia. I sympathized with Pedro, and I was feeling very sorry for him. After about 20 minutes, L had scored with some girl that he met, and he said that they're going home. He asked Pedro if he had any MDMA on him, and he sold some to them, so L left with the girl. People around on the bench have seen that happening, so they wanted some drugs with Pedro, so he started to make lines on his phone again. I told Pedro that I'm going home and wished him the best of luck, grabbed my jacket, and started walking. This is when Pedro called out to me and stopped me said that it's late and he should go back to the hotel too. He scratched the drugs from his phone onto the table, took his belongings and told the people that they can finish whatever was left for free. Myself and Pedro have walked out of the underground club. When we're outside, he asked me if I could walk him to his hotel, which was nearby, a five minute walk. He told me in the club that he has no friends and no family in Slovakia. I really sympathized with him. I told him that, sure, I can walk into the hotel. We were talking the whole walk, and he was saying really nice things to me, like how I get his situation and how much of a good person I am. When we arrived at the hotel, the door was closed, and he messaged to someone to come and open the door for him. He asked if I wanted to have one last beer with him, to which I said, sure, but I will be on my way once we finish the beer. Some girl came and opened the door for us. They have spoken in Spanish as they greeted. The hotel itself didn't really look like a public hotel. There was a reception area, and up the stairs to the left was a dining room. Pedro told me to wait for him in said dining room. This was at like 5 a.m. already. I went into the dining room, and there was a girl sitting there with her laptop. I greeted her with, hola, and sat down. Pedro came after maybe three to five minutes with two open cans of some beverage. There was a parrot and a Jack Daniels logo. The cans were in a gold color, I think. This is the moment that I should get suspicious and not drink from an open can. My naive and drunk ass overlooked this fact and I drank from the can. I was talking to Pedro about all the drug cartels in Colombia and how their policies are fucked up. After about 10 minutes, I started to feel weird, and I looked at my phone. My hands and eyes were tingling. I was quickly aware of what was happening now. I turned on the location and mobile data on my phone, and I put the phone in a different pocket than I did that night. Pedro started to ask me how I'm feeling, to which my adrenaline levels blew up. I started to think that I'm being abducted by some Colombian human trafficking ring. My sight started to weirdly tingle, and the lights were blinding me. 
My jaw was fucked up as I was pushing my teeth together. I have taken drugs in the past, and this felt like a stimulant and a disassociative, which was really weird for me to understand. I tried to keep my voice calm and my mind present. I told Pedro that I know what is going on, and I asked him why he gave me a stimulant if he needs me unconscious. Pedro's hands started to shake, and he didn't answer me. The girl at the laptop has looked right into my eyes. The first time that she even moved with her body. Pedro grabbed his phone and started to write to somebody on WhatsApp. I told Pedro that they did a mistake in the dose and that I'm fine, a part of having been unknowingly drugged. I think that Pedro had drugged me back in the club while I went to the toilet, which was why he quickly got up when I was leaving. Everything else I said, Pedro rewrote to somebody else and he always waited for an incoming message before saying anything to me. I started to talk to the girl too, told her that I don't give a fuck about what are they doing there, but I'm walking out. At one point, I remember saying that I get what Pedro was doing, but I don't get what the girl's part was in all of this, to which I was pointing my finger at her. Pedro had gotten a notification on his phone, and he told me that he is sorry and I can go home if I would like to. I didn't respond to him. I got my drugged ass up, and as I was walking out of the dining room, I stopped by the girl with her laptop, stared right into her eyes, and I held my right hand up in a fist bump. She looked me in my eyes, gave me a fist bump, and did a weird grimace on her face. I walked to the door at the reception, which was closed. I started to kick and punch the doors while yelling, Open the fucking door! The receptionist did, and I walked out. My heart was pumping. My whole body was shaking. I was feeling both dizzy and awake. I ran to the main street, and I was calling my mom to come and get me as fast as possible but I didn't know where I was. I was feeling disassociated and couldn't really apprehend to what just happened. As I got to a main street where a bus stop was, I started to feel very paranoid. There was a white Mercedes SUV that stopped right in the main road near the bus stop that I stood on. They turned off the car lights and were just standing there. I told all of this to my mom and she told me to look for a camera. So I stood up under a camera, which was at the bus stop, to make sure that I'm seen. I was feeling and talking weirdly, to which my mom told me to talk to her, to tell her what I can see around me. I have seen a few people that walk to the main street. Everybody was on their phone and occasionally looking at me. One guy came close to the bus stop, and I approached him, while I still had my mom on the phone. I asked him, what does he want from me? And he was like, uh, I'm sorry, do I know you? Which I said that I'm very sorry. After about 10 minutes of me being on the phone with my mom, the white SUV turned on the engine and leapt off. My mom came by car soon after. I was walking to her car on the road, but I couldn't walk properly. I felt paranoid. Tons of adrenaline going through my body. My heart was pumping so fast, I thought I'm going to have some sort of seizure. I managed to get into my mom's car. She was still in her pajamas, so much scared. I started to tell her everything that happened. I told her to drive around our city instead of driving me home in case they are following us. We were driving around for maybe an hour talked about what happened during the night, how the inside of that building looked and everything. My jaw was going so crazy that my mom could hear it, and she was really scared for me. The whole ride, I was feeling really weird. At one point, I felt like my soul had left my body. I can't really describe it. I didn't feel like myself, like I'm not real. Lights were blinding me, and my vision was blurred and tingling. 
like my eyes were going up and down all the time. I didn't feel any rush of euphoria or anything. I thought that they gave me some mix of a drug cocktail. I arrived at my home at around half past seven. My mom stayed at home with me, comforting me. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. We were talking about going to the police and also about if I'm in any kind of danger anymore. At around 11 a.m., I fell asleep. During this time, my mom cleaned my apartment and my sister came to visit me. I don't know what I would do without my family. One of my girlfriends that was with me during the night came to visit me. As I talked to her, I thought that I got some kind of an episode like schizophrenic or something. Like, why the hell would I be a target of something like this? I'm a chubby bearded guy. Why would they want to abduct me? I'm afraid of going to the police as our police department and politics are corrupt. And they always worked with any kind of mafias as long as I can remember. They would take my testimony, start to investigate, and then they would stop by their officials. I still don't fully believe that what happened to me was an experience with human trafficking. However, there are so many red flags of it in what I can remember. Like, why would Pedro be scared after I called them out? Why would he stop talking to me unless someone sent him a message on his phone? Why would he even start to message somebody during our conversation? Why the fuck would he drug me without me knowing it? But ultimately, why the fuck would they let me go? So Pedro, the two girls from the weird hotel, and possibly the Colombian human trafficking ring, let's not ever fucking meet again. Oh yes, a quick update. I went to the ER with my mom this early morning as I woke up with spasms all over my body. They gave me an IV and sent a sample of my blood for toxology report. They did some tests, EKG and blood pressure, and they sent me home approximately three hours ago. The results of the toxology just came by mail to my mom. There were traces of fentanyl, ethylphenidate, and ketamine in my blood. Also, while I was being given the IV, the doctor said to my mom that this is not uncommon and they have had a lot of patients who have been unknowingly drugged during the last few years. He said that it wasn't this common before. And just when they thought I was out of earshot range, the doctor told my mother, please keep an eye on him before he ends up dead. I apologize in advance if this story is too long. I just need to get this off my chest. My fiance and I are soon to be married and are remodeling an old family home. We started working on the house at about two or three months ago. My fiance bought a bunch of tools to use on the house to renovate. The house has been sitting with nobody in it for over a year. Keep in mind, the house is located in a fairly rural area. A few houses and trailers here and there, but not too much traffic. We have a rodent problem and have been setting traps to catch them. Three weeks ago, my fiancé went to check the traps and we had a rat that was still alive. Long story short, he didn't want to take care of it, so he left. I got off work at 9 p.m. and went over to the house to take care of the rat. It was raining and my mom and brother came with me. I went to the back door and it was wide open and water was blowing into the house. I was pissed. I thought my fiance had left the door open. I shut it and finished my business there. I asked my fiance why he would leave the door open and he claimed that he didn't. I called bullshit and left it at that didn't occur to me that somebody had possibly made a quick getaway. Fast forward to today. My fiancé and I went to our house to throw a whole bunch of trash and stuff in the dumpster. 
that we rented. When he went inside, we immediately noticed that some things were missing. Drills, sanders, etc. We realized that they had been stolen. We called my mother-in-law and told her about it. She says to make a police report. What scares me so much about this is that everything began to click with the rat trap incident. Somebody had been scoping us out. I would go to our house by myself on many occasions and always had the creeps and I felt watched all the time. My little brother even remarked that he felt somebody was watching him there and asked if we were sure nobody was in there while we were gone. I noticed today, when I was there alone, that my dog was acting very nervous and suspicious. She wasn't running and playing like she usually does and didn't want to go to the backyard or wooded area. I'm glad I trusted her and my gut feeling. I don't know if the thieves were there, but I'm glad I didn't find out. We are currently in the process of installing cameras. This had to have been somebody that lives near us and can monitor how often we are there. So, to the person or people that broke into my unfinished home, let's not meet. Ever. Oh, quick update. So we did catch a car pulling in like it was scoping the place out. The people inside never got out, but they left. We asked a few of my fiancé's family members about it, and that was to our own detriment. One of them went and spread the word that we have cameras and somebody in the neighborhood who owned the vehicle thought we caught on camera, slipped up and said that they already knew things had been stolen, which to me is basically a confession because we hadn't told anybody about the robbery until the incident with the car we caught on camera. So now more people than necessary know, and we probably won't catch the person who did it. We still turn the footage in to the police, though, and maybe they can dig up some background information. Before the house I'm currently living, we had a landlord and he acted creepy and weird. He was never at his home, also the apartment, consistently. He would be gone for a day or two or stay in the apartment for a day or two. He would mow the lawn at late hours of the night, sometimes even at 3 a.m. One time we asked him to help with what looked like a water leak in the ceiling and he said it looked fine, but decided he was going to fix our drawer, including the stuff inside. We never got the drawer or the stuff back. There was another family who lived upstairs, and they were having issues as well, and the landlord was supposed to fix them. Well, he complains to us that the teenage girl didn't let him, and she should be punished. The family moved out shortly after, Finally, he would go out a few times a week to feed cats, and there was a lot of cats that also lived outside the apartment. Well, one day, all the cats disappear, with no trace of them. There were no more cats in the area other than his. I had jokingly brought this up to him one time during one of our awkward encounters, and he just laughed awkwardly and didn't say a thing. I believe he ate them or something because he would commonly joke about making cat tacos or how good cats tasted. We just had decided to move after that. So, creepy landlord that may be eating neighborhood cats, let's not ever meet again. I don't know how long this will be. It took me about four days just to be able to write this. I got weird mini anxiety attacks when I tried. I'll be the first to admit that I have had a very can't happen to me complex. And that's kind of what occurred in this story. I'm a university student and live in a rental house with five other people. 
It is far from ideal. But in this housing outcry that we're living in, it takes that sting off of us having to pay a bunch of money a month to exist in a box. This has relevancy, I swear. I got extremely lucky last weekend when the five of the roommates I had were all out for the weekend. This has never happened, so I was ecstatic to have the house to myself. I did the whole 21-year-old girl home alone stuff you can think of. Watching movies with the volume loud, taking long-ass showers, walking around the house without a brawl on, etc., etc. It was around 10 p.m. I had finished some homework and was relaxing with a glass of wine and watching some streaming services. It sounded briefly like there was something moving on the porch. We've had a fox in our yard before, and the thing used to make a lot of noise on our porch, so I assumed that to be the case. After hearing some fumbling the second time, I went over to check through the window. There was nothing there. As I started to head back to the living room, a piece of cement flies through the kitchen window. I don't know. It was cement at the time, but not important. I think I pissed myself a little bit when it did happen, and I definitely screamed like a little girl. My moronic ass started unlocking the door to go outside, but common sense seized control of me again, and I locked the door back. I also ran to the back door to make sure it was still locked. Even though it's glass, it wouldn't make a difference. Oddly enough, at this time, my grandma's words came into my head about something her own mother had told her. If someone tries breaking into your house, turn the lights off. You know the inside of your house better than they do. I shut the lights off in the living room and managed to turn the TV off, which was hard because my hands were shaking. My dad used to give me and my siblings advice on protection measures which were not resonating at this time. I secured myself in my upstairs bedroom. Yeah, go ahead, roast me all you want. And had turned all of the lights out in the house as I passed them. While walking up the stairs, I could hear the doorknob shaking furiously from the front door. Don't know if there was more than one person or if they realized they couldn't jump the fence and get into the backyard. By calling for emergency services on speaker, I secured my hunting knife to the end of my hockey stick with hot pink duct tape. I know that's probably one of the most Canadian things I could say. If I was going to have to use it, at least it would look fabulous. I stayed in the dark, holding my makeshift spear for what was probably about 15 minutes. I'm really glad I wasn't being murdered in that amount of time. The operator told me police were coming, which they eventually did. Took a very unsettling amount of time. The only reason I left the bedroom in the first place was because I heard knocking on the door downstairs and the police lights were flashing through the window. Otherwise, someone would have had to come in and physically pull me out of the room. Statement was given and that's all they did. Literally, all they did. Literally, all they did. <laughs> Nothing else. Literally that. A very nice female officer stayed with me in the house and helped me clean up the glass until my brother showed up to bring me to his place for the rest of the weekend. So, shout out to Officer Cutie with the tattoos. I made an appointment with the doctor to get out on anxiety medication, as well as medication for nightmares. I know I wasn't in any physical danger, at least at that point, but I've had some very charming dreams with similar scenarios, and I was just finding it easier to stay awake. Maybe that's juvenile of me, but I'm only human. Meds were working fine, and I'm back to my house with wall-to-wall -wall people again, and honestly... I don't hate that so much anymore. Please have fun and have a safe weekend. And always remember to keep your eyes peeled. So to the guy or guys that tried to break into my house, I hope we never meet again.
And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. I would like to take this opportunity and give a very special shout out to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all for being such huge supporters of the channel. My heart goes out to you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.